Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Biblical Missionaries. This is lesson one for that series, and it's the series that we'll be studying from July through uh, September of 2015. Lesson one is entitled, The Missionary Nature of God. Have you thought about God being a missionary? Hmm. Well, we'll talk about that. But before we do, we hope you have your Bibles handy, to, because we'll be looking at a number of Bible verses. But let's begin with a word of prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for this privilege we have of studying together, of thinking about you, and of trying to discover some of the deeper meanings that are in Scripture for us. Help us to understand now your attempts at reaching out to us in your missionary outreach, and may we, in this quarter especially, see how that has been manifested through what you have done yourself and through what you have done through prophets and patriarchs in the ancient days is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a little bit of background. There are two worldviews in generally accepted in our world today. Among Christians, this would be. I'm not talking about something involving other religious groups or, or atheists. One of those views holds that man is getting better and better and things are going to get better and better and eventually headquarters are going to be set up in Jerusalem and there's going to be a golden time called a millennium for a thousand years. The other view is quite different from that. It holds that things are getting worse and worse, as suggested by some, Bible, some verses in the Bible, and that eventually it'll get so bad that there will be a time of trouble, there will be Satan coming up, present, portraying himself as Jesus Christ, and eventually um, the, the seven last plagues and the second coming of Christ. Now, I don't know if you've thought about which of those two views you'd rather have. And the question is, which one is true? Well, what, the question I've got is, um, what do you mean by bad? It's getting worse and worse. Well, look around you. What do you see? Well, in a way, isn't, isn't there more understanding about God as time goes on? in very small circles here and there, not worldwide. If you, if you watch... Well, how are you going to weight that? Well, I, I, I'll just give you an example. If you watch Jeopardy, the program on television, people ask, every once in a while they throw a collection of Bible, Bible questions on, on that program. The people who know absolutely ridiculous things about movies and other things, they're standing like dumbfounded when you ask a simple question about the Bible. And these are supposed to be the people who know everything. Well, I, no, no, that's a, that may, maybe that's not a fair group, but I mean, I would have thought those people ought to know that kind of stuff. If you're if you're talking about the amount of people that know the truth, mm -hmm. that that's one thing. But uh, I'm talking about the knowledge that some Available. people know okay. about about the truth, how it's grown. I mean, the whole world used to be pagan until yeah. the disciples went out. Yeah. And so there's a lot more information about God out there, a lot of things from mm. their results. So and you're talking about the amount of information that's available, and that I would agree with you. There's a lot more information. I mean, we have not only all the Bible and many, many translations in some languages and many translations in many different languages, and we have the writings of Ellen White for those of us who are Seventh-day Adventists. There's just an enormous amount of information available. Yes, that's true. So, so in that respect, it is getting better and better. Yes. But if you look, the U.S. prides itself on being a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. But if you really got down to the nitty gritty out of the 300 plus million, there's not a lot of people have more than very, very basic, if that biblical knowledge. I yeah. They, but I think people have a knowledge of religion more than they used to, but not necessarily God. Yeah. I, I don't think we have any idea what it was like when Jesus came to the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got slaves, you've got people that were rubbed down into the ground, crucified all over the place, yeah. all this stuff. I mean, right now, it, it's, a, it's a joy to live 
where we're living now as as opposed to what they had to go through. But you could so be in that in respect halfway around that? the world. You could yeah, you should you should try going to the Middle East for a little while. Well, I think it was pretty bad all over the place, all over the world when the Romans well, had what control. They're coming out of right. Libya right now. They're they're dumping capsizing boats or, or yeah, slicing yeah, their head right. off and uh, yeah. But that was seen, just happened all the time back then. Them over the boat, over the edge. <laughs> well, between now and the end of this world, we face a formidable enemy. Satan knows that if a group of God's people understand him clearly and are willing, are ab willing and able to stand up straight and tall and, and tell the truth about God, it's all over for him. So this is a life and death matter for the devil. Okay? Well, so let's go back to the beginning briefly. What did God have in mind when he created Adam and Eve? He said, I want to make them like myself, right? right yep. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Now, why would he want to do that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, there's, there's, there's several parameters by which to measure that. First of all, if you compare us with the animals, there's no question about the fact that we have freedom, we have, moral, we have the ability to make moral choices and so forth that the animals don't. That's one comparison. Another comparison that has been made frequently is us versus the angels or us versus people living in other parts of the world. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough information to make some kind of a fair evaluation of that question. But, so, but why would he want to make us to reflect himself? Because he wants people, he wants children who can grow to love him. Well, he'd been accused in heaven by, the, by Lucifer originally, who became Shaitan, Satan, the adversary. And this earth was created to answer the questions that were raised by that. Mm -hmm. And the other two-thirds of the angels chose not to go with Lucifer, but they still had questions. They'd heard the allegations and the deceptive uh, deceptions, and he needed uh, a, a theater stage, First Corinthians four nine, so, to explain himself. Yeah. And look at look the way he created man and, and woman, uh, compared to the way he created the other things in Creation Week. I mean, this was a work of art. How much time do you think that the three members of the Godhead spent thinking about how to make a human being? Ever asked yourself that question? Well, I mean, clearly God, you know, there was the the, the qu case of, of, you know, molding the clay just the way he wanted it and then breathing into him the breath of life. I mean, this was a, this was a very carefully calculated, carefully worked out uh, uh, thing. He wanted them to be intelligent because he mm -hmm. expected them and told them that they were to name the animals and look after them. You know, the animals were made during that day, too. Yeah. No, I'm not arguing so, about that. So... Um, you think it was a good was thing. It, it was a good thing that it happened because you can make a comparison yeah. between all the species of animals with humans and whatever. So the question I have: If God made us to be like Himself, does that include? I mean, did He intend for us to develop characters like His? Yes. Wouldn't that seem like logical thing? Um, we didn't have characters like His from the beginning. You mean there was three were <clears throat> sinful at the beginning? I, I must think, have had I think, something. I think we were born as immature beings. We had a lot to learn. So do the angels have his character? Well, presumably, uh, in some ways, but apparently not as much as they should have had. I mean, why were one third of them, third of them dece uh, deceived by the devil? Well, what if the angels were really trying to figure out who this God was? Because of all the questions, and they've okay. never seen him. And they, yeah, they've never seen him. No, they've seen the. Oh, they had son. the one that was like God, Michael, mm -hmm. and, and uh, two thirds of them liked him, and the one third listened to the other side. And he he dealt with uh, an angel that was just following his old freedom, just grabbed him and threw him down to the earth. Why do you think God specifically tells us that we're supposed to be responsible for the other animals, the other creatures on this earth? Well, he also says take dominion over them. Yeah, yeah. So be responsible. You're su be subservient to them. You're not subservient to the animals. You're, but you. I, I'm just reading what the. Well. Says in Genesis. 
there's, a, there's several things that we can say. Obviously, it's true that even today, even though we're far away from the tree of life, our every breath, every heartbeat is dependent upon God. There's a couple of verses that I like to quote on that. There's more, but these two I like. Acts 17, verse 25 and 28. Nor does he need anything. This is Paul's speech to the Athenians. Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. So if we have anything, where did, we, where did it come from? God. came from God. And then verse 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. We're not self-existent. We're all dependent no. upon him. Or totally dependent upon him. Daily, hourly, minute by minute. If God withdraws himself from us, it's all over. Or do if we move away too far, is he going to? Yeah. How far is he going to chase yeah. after us if we're bent on going? Yeah, yeah. Romans one. So your question um, that we discussed actually before the program began: Why did God allow this tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Uh, there wasn't one in heaven, as far as we know. Why? Why was it there in the Garden of Eden? And if Lucifer was able to sin in heaven. He didn't need a tree of knowledge of good and evil. 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Okay. And if, he got, if God is love, He could only create intelligent creatures, including the heavenly intelligences, we call them angels, mm -hmm. that have the capacity to make a choice. And the mm -hmm. choice is to either live in harmony with the Creator or to attempt to go your own self-centered way. Yeah. How do you know what love is then? That's what... You just... You just yeah, I know, but... Uh, without choice, you don't have love. You can't. That's, it's impossible. It's by definition, without a choice, there is no love. So, yes. so freedom is love. Well, it's freedom an is an expression of, of freedom love. Freedom to choose. Freedom to choose is love. Yeah. Well, th isn't that what Satan did? He just chose to do yeah. whatever well, he wants. But no, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, yeah. Back up a second. Let, let's look at historically I, what happened. I'm just yeah. talking about the definition that's yeah. trying to be put out here. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was put in the garden because Satan demanded to have access to, God, to Adam and Eve. And God says, okay, I will allow you in the garden, but I will allow you only at this one tree. This was supposed to be a protection from Adam, for Adam and Eve so that Satan couldn't chase them behind every tree and every bush and every flower he's popping out here and there saying, you know, trying to you know, promote his temptations. God says, your place Yes, I'll give you a place in the garden. I want, a, I want everybody to know that Adam and Eve are free, but it's only at this tree. So it was not a, this was not God trying to tempt Adam and Eve or let, letting Satan tempt Adam and Eve. Its purpose was to protect them. That was the goal. The angels didn't really have that protection then because they didn't, as far as we oh, know. But they had have God. It. They had God sitting there. I mean, well, if, if people are raising questions Michael, about... The one who was like yeah. God. The infinite, no, in, no finite which angels are finite, they're in time and space. Well, space probably not, because they can move around in, through an... Set up well, if God walls. wanted to protect them... Huh? He warned them. Sure. Then why even them. throw him on the earth? Throw who on earth? Satan. He didn't throw him, he let I him I mean, fall. that's, that's the ultimate him. thing, isn't it? Just get him off the earth, that would really protect them. God well, love. but he again, that's a, that. you, 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 you remove their choice if you do that. You remove their choice. Yeah. Well, why even make the choice? Have to make the choice. Because, as we've said before, <laughs> this is what love is all about. What? What? Without full circle. Let, let's, let's look at that. Let, let's go through it really quick. I don't have time to go. There's a handout for those of you who want to go through this in more detail. There's a handout available on our, on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You go down there to the general topics and you'll find a handout entitled Love. But basically, the story is this. In order, to, in order to love, you must also be able to hate. You can't, if you don't have a choice, then you're nothing but a robot. You can go to a tape recorder, you can push the button, and you can say, I love you, I love you, I love you, and as long as you want, and go back and listen to that, and you think, my, isn't this wonderful, this tape recorder loves me. No, that, we all know that that's nonsense. And God doesn't want that any more than we would want that. So God says, I, I will give you freedom. Okay, that means you, have the, you must have the ability to rebel against me as well as the ability to love me. But there's a lot more to that, and that's it. 
you don't really have a choice unless you know what the consequences of those choices mean. And the angels didn't have that. Not, mm -hmm. not fully. No, they didn't. Although God warned them. Yeah. God warned them. Uh, in our case, we, 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 part of living on this earth is to say, okay, what, what are the consequences of doing this? What are the consequences of doing that? And if there's an orderly relationship between what we do and the consequences, that's the basis for science. That's why we can do science, because there's this orderly thing. Well, what does that tell us about God? It means he's a God of orderliness, a God and a God of love. So when it's all done, God says, okay, here's the choices. This is not just chance. You know, the kid, the game the kids play, you put something in your hand, you go like this, and you put it behind your back, and you, okay, which hand it is. Now, assuming that you're, that you're, you know, good at hiding it and it's not too big to stick out somewhere. That's a game of, that's a game of chance. That's not choice because you, you, you don't know what you're getting. Uh, no, God doesn't play games of chance. It's a choice. He says, you can choose this and here's the consequences. You can choose here and here's the consequences. And the choice is basically this. You can choose, choose selfishness and you can join Satan's side or you can choose love and you can join God's side. Those are the, ultimately the two choices. And it's now, when, when God went and warned Adam and Eve that if you take the fruit, you will die, do mm -hmm. you think they understood what death meant? Well, if they didn't at least have some idea, then God is the one who failed. Because no, his job, no, yes, if, hold on. No, what if, God what walked if, with them every evening in the cool of the evening. It says right there in the Bible. So, if, again, if, if you don't know what the issues are, then it's just chance. It's not choice. It's just chance. But what I'm saying is that if God was walking in the cool of the evening, just mm -hmm. talking to it, they're just words. I mean, words have to have, they have meaning. meaning. Of course, they have meaning. How do you get the meaning unless you've seen it? Words well, if you say, "Okay, word," I'm talking yeah. about death here. What is yeah. that? What is well, death? I, well, you I, you kind of you kind of die. Well, what yeah. what died? Show me. Um, you, yeah. you know, you just you yeah, just aren't around anymore. All, all of that, all <laughs> of that, we can understand. But I, I don't believe that God is that bad a teacher that He can't make it clean, make it clear to the two smartest people who probably ever lived on this earth. I think some of this is, can join the, be stacked under the heading of imponderables. We got to get to heaven to find out. Yeah. No, imponderables. No, come on, come on. That's kind of a cop out. No, it's not. What we need to do is is try to figure this stuff out. Maybe, maybe God was doing the, was in the process of explaining that stuff when Adam and Eve sinned. Because how would they know all that stuff unless okay, they Okay, that's it? again, that's an imponderable because we have no way of knowing for sure. We don't have well, a record. You, no, you, no, you've no. Made, you've made a proposition that you can't understand it really if you've never experienced it or seen it experienced. Well, what's the and, purpose of the earth then if that's not true? Well... We got no. thousands I'm, of years to find stories. out. I'm, 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 I'm not convinced that you really have to experience or see it to, to uh, at least they did. I, yeah. I, I, I don't think we, they. I don't think it was necessary. If it's not necessary, there was no reason to even go through all this pain and suffering that's happening on the earth right now. Well, but God didn't make that choice. Well, your ancestors did. Well. <laughs> Mm, well, uh, what I'm saying is that now we're actually seeing it. Right. I mean, it isn't just words. Yeah. It's actually happening. Which makes it all the worse for us if we make the wrong choices. I mean, would we choose okay. to make dumb choices in light of all the information we have? Now, when, she, when Eve chose we to, do. <laughs> in her mind, chose to listen to the arguments of the adversary, uh, she had already had a doubt about what she was hearing. And she chose, and it, I don't think it took a long time, there might, she might have been around uh, on the earth maybe days, weeks, months, years before that happened. But uh, the breakdown, the, the sin process began upstairs in, in, in her frontal part of her. And, and let me talk about another aspect of this that comes into the story. God could easily have used force. And you can call this force whatever you want. He could have just said, nope, I'm not going to allow you to take that fruit. I'm not going to do, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Well, and what would happen? We would lose our freedom. If God is love, by definition, 
you have to have a choice and the choice isn't a gun to your head or I'm going to blow your brains. Oh, I love you. No, that's, that's not a choice. That's duress, extortion, deception, uh, so forth. Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages, page 22, the first paragraph says, the, and this is talking about, of course, the time when Jesus came to this earth. The earth was dark through a misapprehension of God, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love. And love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love Him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all of the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. So think of all the things that have happened because of wrong choices made by human beings. We recognize, I mean, I don't think anybody here in this table at least would argue that God is powerful, that he he theoretically is omnipotent, and he, he could force us to do what he wants. Except he can't force us to love. Yeah, I mean, well, we've already talked about that, but I mean, you know, he does have the power. I, they're not in Congress. They're... Yeah, he does have the power. Um, so we're not arguing about power. Well, how many truly moral choices do we make every day? Continual. Moral choices, you think so? I think so throughout the day, depending where you are, what you're doing, but what do you mean some more than others. What do you mean by moral? I mean they're really free, that you really have sort of an even choice between choosing this one and that one. Right. How many things do we do all day long that are just pure habit? I'm feeling a little tired and would like to get a little lazy, but no, I've got to get back on task here. Is that a moral choice? Yeah, probably. Oh, you make lots of, every decision you make is it's almost... Okay, normal. well, what I, what I was thinking in terms of is this. Satan would love to force us to do his will. And what prevents him from forcing us? God. Doesn't, wouldn't, wouldn't, one, wouldn't one say that someone who is demon-possessed, wouldn't they be, would they be forced? I, I, would, I would kind of Satan conclude that... Yeah. I would kind of conclude that somebody who was in that circumstance, those people were forced. Okay. Now, now, this is I brought this up because we just said God is omnipotent, right? Mm -hmm. So if a person is really demon-possessed, that means God has done it or allowed it? I would say allowed it. On the, on the further premise that that person has let themselves get into circumstances mm -hmm. where Satan got into their head and was able to take over. Mm -hmm. In other words, bad living, drugs, alcohol that burns your finer sensibilities out. Yeah. That's the kind of people that can get that kind of thing. Or if you mess with it, yeah. that's another facet. Spiritism, you get into that stuff, you're looking for real trouble. Well, we know what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned, don't we? They were out of the garden. And a lot of people think that was really harsh. But think about the other alternative. What if God had said, no, um, even though I know you're sinners and you might be tempted to sin once in a while, I'm going to leave you in the garden. You can, you can keep on eating from the tree of knowledge, you can, from the tree of life. Well, it depends if that's, that's kind of a result, getting kicked out, or God continuing his education. Mm -hmm. In front of the angels, in front of, uh, in uh, front uh, of the okay. uh, people. Okay, but I'm asking a different question. What if God let people who sin live in the Garden of Eden? Well, I'm saying that if he did do that, then the, the whole illustration would go, of course, go you're, belly up. You're, well, what, you're, what you're saying is they would have access to the Tree of Life, and therefore, even in their sinful nature, they would be perpetuated. That's right. And I, I, maybe that's the way that thing worked, but I, I, oh, I, oh. I, I, I find that difficult because... Uh, uh, my my understanding is sin is when you, sin is 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 self separation from God. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I'm just not sure. I, I guess I don't. I don't put magical powers died, into that eventually. into that thing. Sin could have spread from their sin if they had not. Well, been the evil angels heaven. will eventually die at the third coming. Yeah. And but in heaven, say, if he had not expelled them, they would still be there. Well, the, those that were sinful ones would these, this is beat each other up and destroyed yeah. each other. Yeah. Well. Uh, let's let's come down here now to a little bit more. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of us really fall under the category described in James 1, 13 to 15. If people are tempted by such trials, they must not say, this temptation comes from God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. And, of course, if you stop right there, we all know where temptation comes from, right? Comes from Satan, yeah, right? But this says, but people are tempted when they are drawn away and trapped by their own evil desires. Then their evil desires conceive and give birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So where do most of our temptations come from? Our own evil desires. Our own evil desires. Wow. Well, look at 1 John 2.16. What does this tell us about sin? Everything that belongs to the world... What the sinful self desires, can, what, would we, what would be another word for that? The sinful self desires. Selfishness, Selfishness greed, yes. greed maybe. What people see and want, that's envy, right? And everything in this world that people are so proud of, that's selfishness maybe, or pride. None of this comes from the Father, it all comes from the world. This is what Satan has done to us, right? Isn't that kind of a definition of separating from God. Yeah. Well, did God ever give up on us at any point? Even though we sinned? Not really. What did he do? Well, if you look over the ages, he's made several attempts, slightly varied here and there with the same thing behind it, trying to get us to straighten out. Well, yeah. When, when you read about the flood, one it's easy to assume that he yeah. kind of, he, she, it, kind of gave up on okay well let's, it even let's, says oh, I'm gonna get this house. is bad news I'm gonna start all over again okay here's another time when people misinterpret the way they read that verse what happened in the flood well first of all before we go that far the first thing God did is came down and he he's looking for Adam and Eve. now of course he knew exactly where they were but you know speaking in human language where are you oh over here. why are you hiding you know he was giving them an opportunity to explain themselves. Fess up. Fess up, exactly, which they didn't do very well. <laughs> but he came looking for them. So we come down to the flood. What happened in the flood? God realized that the way that sin was spreading through the earth, another generation or two, there wouldn't have been anybody left who was listening to him at all. So the fact that he saved that one family... The ones who were listening to him. And this wasn't because God says, I like you and you and you and you. Get on the boat. No, he, the doors were open. Anybody who wanted to could have gotten on that boat. God says, okay, the doors are open. I gave you 120 years of preaching and warning and so forth. The doors are open. You can get in. You can help build the boat. Well, one family got in. God says, okay. They weren't too hot either. So they weren't all that special either. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ellen White comments in this way, In the matchless gift of his Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Steps to Christ, page 68. So we see that God has always been on a missionary outreach to human beings. Of course, the greatest revelation of God's missionary activity this is from our adult teacher Sabbath school, buddy, uh, Sabbath school Bible study guide. The greatest revelation of God's missionary activity can be seen in the incarnation and ministry of Jesus. Though Jesus came to this earth to do many things, to destroy Satan, to prove Satan's, uh, I'm sorry, to reveal the true character of the Father, to prove Satan's accusations wrong, to show that God's law can be kept, the crucial reason was to die on the cross in the place of humanity in order to save us from the ultimate result of sin, which is eternal death. So was that the most important reason why Jesus came to this earth, to die? 
The purpose of dying, though, was was teaching, mm -hmm. not in the nature of a pagan sacrifice or an offering or to something to change God's mind. So... <laughs> Just to change our mind, wow. change wow. our thinking about God. Okay. How does that work? Well, God has been accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And he has to demonstrate his character. He has been accused by the adversary in the, uh, Gen excuse me, uh, Revelation 12. And how does God answer the allegations? Just a denial on his part does not settle it. No. He has to demonstrate, and that's what this is. The first, first Corinthians 4 and 9, this earth is a theater stage to tell the story about God mm -hmm. and how to live. Does anybody else need to see that besides those of us here on this earth? Sure, angels in heaven. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, we are the theater of the universe. And, and Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, Colossians 1, 19 to 20. The purpose of the church is to teach the universe. They want to see what kind of changes God's love and, and Christianity can make in the lives of human beings. And John 12, 32, properly translated, mm -hmm. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all, and I would, it means... All, all intelligences, really? those in heaven as well as the earth, earth to, to him. Well, there's a very interesting statement found in the Signs of the Times, July 12, of 1899, that basically is not quoted anywhere, but it's a very interesting. I want you to think about this. It was, now we just said that Jesus came to die to save human beings. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. So he came and lived and died for our benefit so that who can get the education? The heavenly universe. The, heavenly universe. the throne of justice must be eternally and forever made secure. Whose throne is that? God's, God's, God's throne. throne. God's throne. Even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. What does that mean? And that word atonement, could we, excuse me, the word redemption, could you substitute the word at one mm -hmm. to bring out harmony, bring harmony, bring a state of at one yeah. among all of the heavenly intelligences as well as this, the beings on this earth? Could, could, could God have justified his character? I mean, could, he, could the message have been presented adequately even if every human being were lost? That's what it says here. And this is not, this is, Ellen White says this, but this is actually a direct reflection of one verse in the Bible. You know what verse it is? Romans 3, verse 4. May you win your case when you are judged. But and not only that, it says, even though every human right. being is a liar, even yeah, though right. every human being is a liar, God has to win his case. So this is, we, we read this from Ellen White because she spells it out in relatively modern English. But it's right there. Paul said it too. By the sacrifice, and Ellen White goes on, by the sacrifice Christ was about to make, all doubts would be forever settled. And now she, he's, and she's not just talking about here on this earth. She's talking about in the universe. All doubts would be forever settled and the human race would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone can restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary will be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. How many people does that leave out? How many individuals, whatever you want to call them? The entire universe, right? Who is able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth? How many disciples? No, it says his trial in the judgment hall, his crucifixion. Who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels, period. Not a single human being got the message at that point in time. Not one. The message is? Well, there's a whole bunch of messages, but the fact that sin leads to death, and the fact that Jesus was God himself, he was able to rise from the tomb in his own power, those are the two most important facts. See, if, if Jesus had died in the Garden of Gethsemane, we would have thought it was a heart attack or something like that. We didn't realize what was going on. Jesus died of sin, 
right there in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he died again on, on Calvary, twice. All the evidence is there in Scripture. Well, Jesus was crucified on a cross to save us. That's, that's, that's the part that most human beings are interested in. He suffered the consequences of sin that was ours. Where do we read that? That's Isaiah 53, isn't it? All the while we thought that it was punishment sent by God. How many Christians teach that Jesus died on the cross to suffer a punishment imposed upon him by the Father? The majority. Not just a majority. Uh -huh. Probably 99%. How many Christians believe and teach that the death of Christ was a punishment sent from God? Jesus died the second death to show us what he meant in Genesis 2.17. What does it say in Genesis 2.17? Except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and bad, you must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. Now, lots of water has gone under the bridge since that happened, but no one had yet proven what happens when you actually die of sin. Of course, we know that Jesus was never a sinner, but God says, I, I, I have to do this so you can see exactly what happens when sin kills people. Would, would I be correct in saying that God's mission outreach to the universe was a unilateral success? A unilateral success, yeah. absolutely. Then why is it seem to not be so successful through the last 2,000 years? That's a very good question, and the only, there's only one answer, and it's the responsibility of one person, Satan. Because for him... If some of us finally get the message, it's all over for him. So the longer he can delay it, the longer he gets to live. And I think, you think he wants to live? Of course he does. He, wants, he, would, he, does. he would like to take over this entire world and make it his headquarters. I think he wants to get out and he wants to take as many people as he want, can uh, well, get if, out. If he, he, is a, okay. he is the kingdom of death. He yeah. is the head yeah. of the king of the dead. I would follow you a certain way. He says, if he's going to die, he wants to take as many people. I mean, misery loves company. He wants to take as many people with him as he possibly can. But he would much prefer to live. Well, I think he wants to die. I think <laughs> Because he cannot, he cannot stand being around God. And he can't go anywhere without God being around. Yeah. I think he's oh. a supreme sociopath. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an election. Nobody wants to lose big time. They want to lose just a little bit. So he wants to take out as many bit. as he can. Yeah. So well, that, from that quote you read from the Desire of Ages earlier, it's a very powerful quote. Uh, one of the sentences is, by love, only by love is love awakened. Mm -hmm. What is Satan and his angels doing to where that is not being as so successful here. Well, they're they're trying to they're trying to promote a, a kingdom of hate of selfishness. So the selfishness aspect is what is Satan's approach that? is. Uh, it's all about me, even with his evil angels. If you read Ellen White, you know he doesn't care about them. All he cares about is himself. And if we want to follow his example, we'll end up the same place he ends up. If we think the only thing that matters is me, myself, and I, you're square on Satan's side. So let me ask this question. How is the mission of God, we've talked a little bit about it here, how is the mission of God related to our mission? Well, Jesus said some things that a lot of people don't seem to really believe. He says, I came not to judge but to be the Savior to the world, John 3, 17 and 12, 47. And he went on to say that just as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you, John 20, 21. So does, what, doesn't that suggest that our mission should be something like his? Yes. And if we suggest that his mission was primarily to teach the truth about God, what would that say about us? Supposed to be doing the same thing. Jesus had some words to say about that in Matthew 5, starting with verse 13. You are like salt 
for the uh, whole human race. But if salt loses its saltiness, there's no way to make it salty again. It has become worthless, so it is thrown out and people trample on it. You are like light for the whole world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lamps a, lights a lamp and puts it under a bowl. Instead, he puts it on a lampstand where it, will give, where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. So our purpose here is not to uh, see how much praise we can get for ourselves, even if we were the most wonderful church that ever happened. No, our, our purpose is to give glory to God. What's the difference between salt and, and, and light? Salt and light? Mm -hmm. How does salt work? Well, you taste that. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you eat salt straight by itself? If Not you very do, long. it won't be long. <laughs> <laughs> so, in other words, what I'm saying is that salt needs to be mixed in with the food that you're eating in order to be to be palatable, really, to to you know do its job. You mix it all in. I used to be a baker. You mix it all in the bread. There's no you no trace of the salt left, but Without it there, you wouldn't have the same kind of bread. What about light? How do you how do you use light? To illuminate. Yeah, but you don't mix it in with anything. You you put it out and you know, let it be as open as possible. It can it 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 illuminates things from the outside, right? Salt works from inside. Light works from outside. In what ways are we supposed to be like salt? In what ways are we supposed to be like light? Is that a difficult question? <laughs> well, I've never Thanks. had it put that way before. It takes some time to think about okay. it. <laughs> well, you, can, you can come up with, you know, light goes everywhere and it's bright and no matter, even if even a small candle in the right environment can be seen for miles. That's right. Yeah. For miles. But the whole ocean is salty, too, and that goes for miles and miles yeah. and miles. Well, I think that's salt of the earth. That's kind of what it's getting at. If yeah. there's enough of the salt around, it's going to spread throughout the earth. Okay. So sense. salt would be representative of the way we're supposed to mix with yeah, people in the world and try to influence them by being among them. Yeah. Light would be an example of how we are supposed to be shining forth the truth about God, which they don't have. And, and thus making it visible to all of them. So there's, that's just a couple of ways in which we might be salt and we might be light. Well, what was God's original plan for the children of Israel? Well, they were going to be the light of the world as it was then. They were supposed to be. They were supposed to be the healthy, happy, holy people. And the whole world was supposed to be excited about it and come flocking to them. And unfortunately, it didn't work out like that. I don't think they had the salt. <laughs> you need to have the salt first. Yeah. Well, there's still a great source of information. Yeah. Yep. One way so, or the other. Sometimes I wonder, as, as you look at these stages, that we're, we're talking about the children of Israel right now, the stages that they went through, is if God wasn't, in part, showing it didn't make any difference what system that you had, you could not count on that system to, to save you. We're not saved by systems. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if I, I have wondered that if each one of those was not a lesson, we'd look to, hey, we're a nation. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a way that we can, I don't know, do whatever God wants us to do. Um, and the patriarchal system didn't work, that didn't work, so then they went to a king, we tried mm -hmm. the king, that doesn't work either. Um, then we went into chaos, that doesn't work either. I, I, I just wonder if part of the lessons of these different stages mm -hmm. of, of existence, of being, of God's people, part of it wasn't lessons to show you cannot look to these things mm -hmm. either. What influence do Christians in general have on this world? In general? Mm -hmm. In general? What, what do you mean by in general? As a mass? As a group? Well, yeah, or? as a group. 
I think they're a blessing. I think if you were to look closely, you would find that wherever Christians, true Christians have been, so you're trying. finding you're finding yeah, find Christian. you're finding uh, it, any group of people that even uh, um, they don't even have to be pure Christians. Any little tiny little bit that you embrace is going to be a blessing. I Here, here's a, here's a very interesting statement from Ellen White again. This is a Desire of Ages, page three hundred six, paragraph two. Hearts that <laughs> respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessings flow. Or flows, God's blessing flows. Were those who serve God removed from the earth and his spirit withdrawn from among men, this world would be left to desolation and destruction, the fruit of Satan's dominion. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people whom they despise and oppress. Well, look at history. <laughs> Yeah. Look at what's, yes. what's happened with history. Wherever the Christians have gone, the United States, and, it's, and they've gone out uh, mm -hmm. to telling the good. Look at the quality of people's lives wherever Christians have gone. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there's some hyperbole, uh, some ex yeah. examples that, that would... Well, she goes the other side now, continuing the quotation, but if Christians are such in name only, they are like the salt has lost, that has lost its savor. They have no influence for good in the world. Through their misrepresentation of God, they are worse than unbelievers. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. Yeah. Actually, I said it was paragraph 2. It's paragraph 4 of page 306 in Desire of Ages. So how well are we doing? Are we misrepresenting God or are we correctly representing God? Well, I think we do. if... if, if if what we have kind of postulated here is wherever Christianity is, there is a, a prosperity, then um, at the end of time, there's got to be Christianity around. Mm -hmm. um, using Christianity as a very broad term uh, to identify those who, who are, want to be like God and are servants of God. But nevertheless, despite that, things wind down into a suffering uh, God has to step in because, you know, it, it will just self-extinguish if he doesn't step in there at the last mm -hmm. minute. So, so are, we, are we more like clubs for saints or are we more like hospitals for sinners? <laughs> what are we talking about, about benefits here? Uh, Jim was saying, well, wherever Christianity is, you have prosperity. You know, there was, a, I think the Romans would say, that, that there was prosperity there, and they were a very brutal, a very brutal nation, and, and their origins were blatant paganism, well, they and, were, they, and always were. And remember, they lived at a time when it was believed that might makes right. Yes, but they prospered. Well, because and they had, they were mighty. It's well, but but that. but it, but doesn't doing the right thing bring about prosperity, and doing the wrong thing bring about um, degeneration? Okay, so how do you how do you how do you, if you, how look do you at, juggle that? If you look at the Earth's history, recorded history, mankind, in the broad sense, has been a very unreliable customer. <laughs> oh, really? Soon, and God has had to step in and try and straighten it out. And we've had multiple hundreds, probably even thousands, of wars and skirmishes. And sooner or later, it's got to end. Mm -hmm. And I think we are living in that time because we now have the time and we've had it for the last 70, 80 years. We could destroy ourselves if God lets us. Was Job a prosperous man because he was a righteous <clears throat> man or because God just said, well, I'm going to bless you? Was Abraham a prosperous man? Um, yes. Yes, he was. Because, because he did the right thing. Are there people who do the right things that are not prosperous? Yes. <laughs> well, how come? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the story of the middle part of Job's life. Well, no, Job was... That's a, an unusual case, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How well are we doing at witnessing the way God wants us to? And I'm, I would like to read from Ellen White again. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 29, paragraph 3. The Church of Christ on earth was organized for missionary purposes 
and the Lord desires to see the entire church devising ways and means whereby high and low, rich and poor may hear the message of truth. Not all are called to personal labor in foreign countries, in foreign fields, but all can do something in, by their prayers and their gifts to aid the missionary work. Now you might guess that that was in the days when she was in Australia and was asking for some help down there. Isn't, isn't there ebb and flow in that experience? Aren't there times when you do mm -hmm. better than others and you never, ever reach God's ideal? <laughs> Well, so, so if we did, we would be in heaven. Can't you be satisfied with what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you doing? Well, I think some of us don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're just doing our doing, and we don't know how much are we're doing. we. Are we a Seventh-day Adventist doing a good job of clearly explaining why Jesus had to die? Well, not any more than we're doing better at other things we should be doing better at. But some things we're doing better at than we're doing... We're doing pretty better. well at offering health care. If we yes. were doing that, that would mean we were correctly representing him. Yes. And then the end would come. Mm -hmm. So it would appear... Say, that, say, you mean, you say mean, that again. Say that again. Let, let me say it for you. Yeah. <laughs> the reason we're still here is that we haven't done a good enough job. But I thought so it's our works that d that's keeping it back. I you can call you it just a, said a that. If you, if you, you can call it works if you want to. We've got a job to represent God. And if you call, want to call that works, you how can. But I, 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 don't, I don't care what. Do you study and figure it out to how to, how to represent I God? I know that there are many verses in the Bible that say that's the truth. And I choose to believe. What about the latter rain? Doesn't that come from heaven? Yeah. Well, but why doesn't it we, come? Why isn't it here right now? Kind of a drought right now. <laughs> we're, not, we're having a wait, drought. That's, that's what the problem it's is. Because we're not prepared for receiving it. So it's all our fault. It is. I don't know. I think so God has you, you saved by our think, works. <laughs> saved no, by no, our no, works. No, no, this is the end ending it by our works. I guess that's what it. It's not saving. It's ending it by our works. I guess. Myra, you're awfully quiet, but it looks like you have something to say. Oh, I, I do, <laughs> but I don't know how to put it in. <laughs> right words. I, I disagree with Gary in works. <laughs> I disagree okay. with Ken and it's all our, all our fault. <laughs> but I don't believe, I don't believe Good. God is sitting there going, I'm going to, you know, he may be punishing us for not doing, you know, certain things correctly. Is punishing who? I don't think it's punishment. Not punishment, but... Get, gets well, isn't being it's here a punishment enough? Yes. I mean... <laughs> I think it gets back to one of the original go. questions on this program, mm -hmm. that are we in the hospital for sinners, or have we got ourselves mm -hmm. off in our little enclaves, and you can go anywhere in the world, and you will find Adventist enclaves, and therein yeah. lies a big part of the problem. Well, I, I would like to read the, one of the main passages that I supports my view, right from 2 Peter 3, starting with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. The earth will be, every, with everything in it will vanish. Now, I hope there's nobody here who's going to disagree that that means kind of the end of things, right? Mm -hmm. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. So God is asking us to do our best to make it come soon. What does that mean? It means well, what does it mean? all different with different people. Not everybody oh, yeah, that's there's an ideal out there. Mm -hmm. but not everybody's going to meet that. What do you do to work things out so that the thief will come? Well, it's not. He's not coming as a thief. He, he, he it says he's going to come as a thief. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> not talking like about it. evil people. I'm talking about the timing and the surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what happens when a thief comes. You have a surprise. Yeah. You go into your room and your stuff is gone. You're yep. surprised. And we, so what did you do to make... That thief come 
Uh, to make thieves, that surprise happen, thieves come it when they when they anyway. get the mo when they get the opportunity. He also when, says, when things are right, the we've we've often mentioned here that there, as soon as there's a, a people who are ready, then the Lord can come. Mm -hmm. But you know, what about some people? At, what about junior high kids? Uh, they haven't lived long enough to really be ready. You know, I had well, the one junior high principal describe junior high kids as half animal and half hormone. <laughs> you know, how are they how are they going to I mean there's going to be junior high kids alive when yeah. this happens. So how are they going to be one of our one of our prominent SDA theologians made this statement. I see what you think cuz we're running out of time. Jesus did not create a church and then give it a mission as one of its tasks. The divine sending plan comes prior to the church. Mission gives birth to the church and is its mother. If the church ceases to be missionary, it has not simply failed its task, it has actually ceased being the church. True or not true? Well, I think it's true. Part of it makes sense. <laughs> Getting back to Gary's comment, though, we're also told to hold fast till I come. I think there's going to be an element of surprise for those of us who hopefully yeah. will be ready. We'll say, what's that cloud? Mm -hmm. Things are going to be so bad, we might not have a lot of time to really think. You just do the best you can and hope when it's... You're, when you're in the middle of the seven last plagues. Yeah. How about the Revelation 13? Isn't that somewhat yeah. descriptive of what's going to be going on? Yeah. It says the whole world wondered after, the whole world worshipped the beast in his image. Well, what is it? It, it, it? People are religious. Yeah. That's it. Uh, so they must have the wrong concept to God. Yeah. Well, we've got just a few seconds left. Let us never forget, if we're Christians, that the mission is not our mission, it's God's mission. He was the original missionary. He is reaching out to us continually. He's doing everything possible to reach out to us. We talk about unentered territories. We talk about contextualization. And these, these, are, these are good things. They, they help us to, to find ways to reach the areas we couldn't otherwise reach. But our primary task is to represent God in the world in a way that, will, that God feels is, is adequate. And I'll leave that up to him to decide what's adequate to, to be the, the, the final warning to the world and prepare them for the time when Jesus comes again and you and I need to be a part of it. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these opportunities we have to discuss these issues and for differences of opinion that help people to think, guide and direct that the words that we send forth may be a blessing to others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.